Good evening. Good evening, everyone. My name's Andy Beforth, and I'm the Chief Executive with the Cumbria Community Foundation. Thank you for joining us this evening for this event brought to you by the Community Foundation and the Foundation's Cumbria Club. The Cumbria Club is an inclusive and informal association of people who have a passion for Cumbria and the Lake District. Membership is open to individuals and families who live outside Cumbria and those who live in Cumbria and want to welcome others into our communities. Now, membership of the Cumbria Club presents an opportunity to engage with others with an interest in the many dimensions of Cumbria, including our landscape, communities, culture, environment, economy and history. The Cumbria Club supports the work of the Cumbria Community Foundation. We are a charitable foundation that uses our endowed funds and direct donations to provide grants to address disadvantage across Cumbria. Details of how to become a member and a copy of the foundation's annual review are available online and for collection in person uh, as you leave this evening. Um, what I should have also said is it's absolutely fantastic to see so many people here in person, but I should say also we've got, I think, over 160 people joining us uh, through live stream, so uh, hello to you, those of you who aren't in the room. Now, climate change is a major concern for all of us, and particularly in Cumbria, which is especially vulnerable to issues such as flooding, flooding and fuel poverty, something which is, which is experienced by 10% of all of our households. We're also home to the UK's nuclear industry, which advocates for its role in contributing to net zero. In the last 22 years, the foundation has directed over £50 million in philanthropic funds to help the people of Cumbria. Now, philanthropy is an important tool, as well as a difficult word to say, in supporting, <laughs> in supporting the change required to achieve carbon zero. And this evening's event will inform the work the founda Foundation undertakes with its donors going forward. And the Foundation's already begun to make changes to the way it works. For example, all of our grant making is now mapped against UN sustainability goals. The Foundation's £27 million endowment is invested on an ESG basis. We fund community and public transport projects local food, food growing projects and raise thousands of pounds each year for our winter warmth appeal. We know we can do more, both our grant making and how we behave as an organisation. Addressing issues such as climate change requires system change. Increasingly the foundation is convening people and organisations across Cumbria to devise multi-layered programmes of activity to address the root causes of issues such as child poverty, health inequalities and mental health so that we can try to influence change across systems. We at the Community Foundation are committed to applying the same approach to the issues of climate change in Cumbria. We've brought this evening and this distinguished panel together with our partners at Armstrong Watson, Reged and the University of Cumbria and I would now like to hand over, it, over to the person who has been the driving force behind this evening's event Cumbria Club Committee, Steve Curl. Welcome, Steve. Gosh, this is a great way of getting a suntan. Um, so, my name is Steve Curl, and uh, I've been involved in all sorts of things in Cumbria, but uh, tonight I'm just an individual trying to help the Cumbria Club, mission number one. And mission number two is to promote the moves to net zero in Cumbria. Um, it's going to be a cooperation between everybody in Cumbria to achieve what needs to be achieved, and we'll hear about that later on. So it's really important to have events like this, especially with the live streaming to other parts of the county and elsewhere. So thank you very much for attending. We've got a great audience, and we've got members in the audience who are individual people that have got a keen interest in this, people representing communities, and people representing Cumbrian businesses and other organisations. So together we've got the manufacturing companies of Cumbria in the audience, businesses, services, banking, finance. Britain's Energy Coast is with us this evening on the west coast of Cumbria. Cumbria Tourism and lots of organisations from the tourism and visitor economy. We've got Cumbria's arts and culture sector, the farming community and their associated industries. The Environment Agency is with us. 
Friends of the Lake District, Lake District Foundation, Lake District National Park, Yorkshire Dales National Park, which of course is really in Cumbria, uh, <laughs> local government uh, and uh, also representatives from Lancaster and Lancashire, Natural England, Natural Trust, National Trust I should say, uh, a range of retailers including Booths and Lakeland, Sellafield and a wide range of third sector organisations and charities. I think their attendance, everybody's attendance, your attendance, really emphasises how joined up Cumbria can be when it wants to be. Now, my final presence, of course, is the University of Cumbria. Julie Menel, the Vice-Chancellor, is with us. And all the cameras tonight for the live streaming, the live streaming and everything else, is being run by the films and arts people at the university who are doing undergraduate courses to learn how to produce TV films and everything else. So it'll be interesting to see everything afterwards when they've edited it together nicely. Um, our audience today spans Great Britain, from Scotland to Wales to the Southwest Peninsula, through London to Kent, and all places in between. We've also got participants from overseas, including Turkey, uh, which obviously has a keen relationship with Cumbria, and Houston. And the fact that Houston is online, and greetings to Malcolm if you're out there. Um, I want to say, Houston, we have a problem. <laughs> because the problem is, how are we going to get to carbon zero by 2037? That is going to be one huge challenge and a date set by Cumbria's community. Uh, not the Community Foundation, by the entire community of Cumbria with some 80 organisations. So in terms of this evening's plan, what we're going to do, um, we've got until 7.30, so an hour and a quarter. First, we're going to have four pretty brief presentations. The first one is from Professor Mike Berners-Lee, who is a well-known authority on carbon, climate change, net zero, wrote books like How Bad is a Banana? The answer is pretty good. Um, and There is no Planet B. Uh, he will be followed by Karen Mitchell, who's the CEO of Cumbria Action for Sustainability, CAFS. Now, CAFS is a really interesting organisation, which Karen can explain to you, but she's also Deputy Chair of the 80 organisation Zero Carbon Cumbria Partnership, which is coordinating a lot of work, especially with the communities in Cumbria. Um, thirdly, we have Richard Leaf, the CEO of the Lake District National Park Authority, who will speak fairly briefly, followed by Dr. Simon Carr from the University of Cumbria, uh, where he's a lecturer in geography and has an acute interest in our fells and landscape more generally. So I think what we'll do is we'll let the presentations run sequentially. We should be through them in half the time we have available to us. And then we'll have plenty of time, I hope, for questions. We've had questions submitted online by people registering here. There's been quite a bit of overlap. We've had lots of them, so I've tried to pull those together. We've also had questions from the attendees online. So hopefully we can structure the questions in an appropriate way and, of course, bring the audience here in Reged in. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to hand over to Mike Berners-Lee um, to tell us about the global situation and how it relates to Cumbria. Mike, over to you. Two microphones now, fantastic. Um, okay, so uh, next slide. 
And just very quickly, some of those books, and then just to say, I work at Lancaster University, but also with a ton of businesses. Um, I don't really want to talk about that, but just to say, it's been very interesting how the kinds of conversations with businesses and all sorts of organizations that we have at Small World, which is my, my business, uh, has changed over the last couple of years. And it used to be sort of a bit of stuff about carbon footprinting and how can we cut our carbon a bit. And then it's... Uh, how can we get to net zero? And now it's really more and more the, the organizations we're working with are saying, we get it, there's a real climate and wider environmental emergency on our hands. We get it that this actually affects absolutely everything about every, everything this organization thinks, says, and does. Um, you know, how can we find a pathway through that? So it's a much more energized and holistic kind of uh, conversation that we're having these days compared to even a short time ago. Okay, next slide. So this big... Just to look at the big picture, this is just a rough graph of global energy use over the last uh, few years, and look at it going up and up and up. And actually, it's been going up for millennia. Um, and you know, humans have been getting more powerful. One way, one way of looking at that energy use is it's, a me it's one measure of how powerful a species we are. Um, and this, all that fantastic energy supply is done brought us many wonderful things. It's allowed us to be sat here in comfort with all this light around us and all this technology and all kinds of stuff. But it's also true to say that with this increasing use of energy, we, in we increasingly influence the planet that we're living on. And for um, millennia, it didn't matter that we were becoming a more and more powerful species because the planet was still, broadly speaking, we could get away with considering as robust, considering compared to everything we could throw it in. And just gradually, recently, that, started, that balance of power between us and the planet started to shift. And 100 years ago, we couldn't smash the whole place up, even if we tried. We probably did try quite hard around about that time. 50 years ago, we'd got to a point where humans could, if we really did something stupid like have a big nuclear war, smash the whole planet up. But now we've got to a point where we don't have to be particularly stupid. We just have to not be careful enough, and we are smashing the place up at pretty high speed at the moment. So, um, next slide. Oh, just click again. Uh, so, you know, one, some people use this big word for it, the Anthropocene, to be this era we've entered into in which it's humans that are the big thing affecting the ecosystem. And we're in it now, like it or not. And one, my little graphic for it is that the transition we've made is it used to be like that with small species on a big planet, and now it's like, just click again. Now it's like that, we're a huge species on a big planet, and it's a completely different context for humanity to be operating in. And so when people talk about system change, what they mean is we need to change to living in a way that is actually fit for a totally new context where we're, where we're so powerful. And uh, we've had a few decades of being in this Anthropocene. You can, we can argue about exactly how long we've been in it for. But what's clear about right now is this is the moment where if we can't make the transition to an Anthropocene fit way of carrying ourselves, then we're going to be in an incredible amount of trouble. And nobody knows exactly the time scale, exactly how that will pan out, but it's pretty clear that it won't be good. And uh, so suddenly we're in this situation where it's not just climate change, it's a whole load of different physical challenges that we're up against all at once that are all interconnected um, and we can't think about them one at a time. We have to think about them all together if we want to deal with them sensibly. And uh, the good news is that from a technical and scientific point of view, we've broadly speaking got the solutions to all of that, or we, or we, can, we can bring them about pretty quickly. So that takes us on to you know, the real crunch of it, which is how do we live, how do we do life, how do we, you know, all sorts of other things about how humans carry themselves. So next slide. So here's my little, you know, my try my sort of summary of there's no planet B and uh, of the situation we're in. So in green around the outside, we've got some of the kind of more obvious physical presenting challenges. So we've got climate and an energy transition and related to that transport, we've got this population growth that's, uh, that's, uh, that's going on. And just as important as climate but gets less airtime is the biodiversity challenge that we're hemorrhaging our biodiversity at the moment. And while we deal with that, we've got to feed this riding, rising population, and then at the same time as that, we've got to deal with all these pollutions that we're, pollutants that we're putting out, which plastic is just one of them, um, and we've got disease threat um, 
alongside all of that. So, but from a, you know, from a technical perspective, actually, it doesn't, there's nothing stopping us dealing with all of that. And that takes us into the stuff in, in purple there, which is you know, maybe some of the, um, you know, what would it take for us to be dealing with these technically solvable challenges? And that takes us into, I think, inescapably into maybe the crunch point of No Planet B is a, a question about values. And I think this really came out strongly in the COP, is that at the end of the day, you know, we need a, a, le a level of global cooperation that humans have never had to have before. We're going to need to learn to treat each other with respect at the global level in a way that's, that's never been done before and, and, and possibly, arguably has never been quite so necessary. And we're going to need to treat the other species on this planet with a level of respect we've never had to do before. And we're possibly <coughs> going to need to be um, respect the truth about what's going on in a way that we've kind of drifted into not really bothering with that much arguably in some of our politics. And then really strongly came out in the COP this question of inequality. It looks like the more you think about climate and the more you think about trying to get those international deals going and how, what would it take for India to be happy to sign up to something stronger on coal, just for example in China, you know, uh, you know somehow this, you, there's not going to be a climate solution without something about a justice solution as well. The two are just the more you think about it, the more closely linked. They're not two separate agendas there, absolutely. If you want one, you have to have the other two. Uh, so truth and trust, I've talked about, you know, whole questions about how we do economics. Um, it's not surprising that an economic framework that was built up in an era in which you could, humans could just expand every time they wanted to might not be totally fit for purpose in, the, in actually, act exactly as it is in a world in which we there are some, th some ways in which we've always grown in which we can't any longer grow. There are some ways in which we can still grow, but, but um, we can't, for example, grow our climate emissions, our carbon emissions any further. And there are huge implications for business. And I think I just want to emphasize this point again that it's really clear that um, you know, this, uh, the environmental challenges that we're facing right now affect everything about how a business carries itself. So, you know, if a, if a business comes to us saying, well, we want to be net zero, we come to them saying, do you mean you want to do the right thing by the climate and environmental emergency? Because if the answer is yes, then let's have a look at everything that that might entail. What are your goods and services? How do you communicate? What's going on in your supply chains? You know, just everything. What's going on in your pension scheme? It affects absolutely everything. Um, and technology you've talked about and politics I won't go into and uh, you know and, and some new ways of thinking we need to get better at the one I've just touched us we need to get better at uh, we need to get better at a bit of global compassion not just being compassionate with people who live next door to us but thinking about people on the other side of the world as well and we need to get better at that kind of systemic joined up thinking that we've never had to be quite so good at as we need to be right now that we're in the Anthropocene so, okay, that's a summary of the big picture. So, um, next slide. Okay, let's have a look at how we're doing. So, that's a graph of global emissions from fossil fuel use for over the last, uh, since 1990, since the first, the first COP. And there it is. And for the f most of that curve, it's going up pretty well exponentially. The long-term trend for 160 years was was pretty well mathematically exponential, give or take a little bit of noise between individual years. And if you look at the top years there, you can see, well, if you look at the sort of major events in there, if you were looking at this from Mars, you'd say, well, what, what's going on for humans? And you'd notice that we'd had one or two incidents. You'd notice that the Soviet Union dissolved. You'd notice that we had a financial crisis. You'd notice that we'd had a pandemic. And you might, you'd kind of scratch your head and say, well, yeah, have humans noticed climate change yet? Um, you know, because they have this big meeting every year called a COP, whatever it is. You know, have they noticed climate change? And you, I don't know, you know, the last few years there, they are consistent with us having noticed climate change, but they're actually also consistent with us having not noticed climate change. Right? There's nothing statistically significant in that that says that all this talk and action around the world on climate ha has done anything whatsoever. And I'm not saying that to be depressing, I'm just saying it to 
give a sense of just how much we need to raise the game and how much we need just a whole tipping point for a systemic change. I'm allowed 20 minutes to think about it. I think I'm all right from quick. Okay, next slide. So why is that? Well, you know, with this whole phenomenon of, of human, um, you know, of, of human denial and just, just not facing up to it. But I think, you know, the evidence, if there's a good news story from COP, you know, the, op the most optimistic take that I could put on it would be that the evidence that that head is trying to come out of the sand is stronger than it's ever been. And the first millimetre of pulling that head up will be the hardest one. And maybe we've done the first millimetre, maybe the first couple of millimetres. And maybe now if we all pull hard, you know, over the next year, that head might actually come out of the sand. We might actually, we might actually get to the point where humans have woken up to this thing in the way that we need to. Um, that would be my optimistic take. The picture of the balloon squeezing up there is just beca is because uh, the way the global dynamics of carbon tend to go is that if one part of the world economy cuts its carbon, unfortunately, there's a nasty tendency for some of that carbon cut to be undone by a kind of counter effect in the rest of the system. The rest of the system adjusts to take up the slack a bit. And that, don't interpret that as meaning there's nothing we can do in Cumbria. There absolutely is. But what it means is that what we do in Cumbria has to be, has to be helping to create the conditions under which the whole world can undergo that kind of systemic tipping point. So how do we make it easier for other parts of the world to do it as well? Because they can look at Cumbria and go, crumbs, they can do it. Well, maybe we can too. So it's about being an exemplar and, a, and, um, and an inspiration to, to others, which we're really well placed to do. Okay, next slide. This is just, I was asked to say a couple of things about, well, what do I think about where the COPs got to? So this is the um, uh, Carbon Action Tracker. This, is, this was their kind of summing up of what the kind of, the, all the pledges from the different countries got to and, and so on. So, the white line going up there, see if my finger will point, no it won't. Um, the white line there shows where we're up to now, it's about 1.2 degrees of temperature rise and the green, up to the top of the green is what we've kind of arbit slightly arbitrarily said is a safe limit. Actually we don't know that, that we can get away with 1.5 degrees for sure, it still got, it entails some risk but there's kind of a pretty widespread consensus that we don't want to go, we definitely don't want to go at all above that. And if you look at the various, diff all the different pledges and actions and plans and everything. If you look at just the, um, just the policies that have got actions behind them, that takes us, and you say, well, supposing they're all implemented, that takes us to 2.7 degrees, which, to be clear, is going to be, would be a really nasty experience for humanity, not just for people on the other side of the world that we can forget about. You know, for all of us, that would, that would be, that would be pretty, uh, pretty big time. Um, if you take the most optimistic scenario, they say we might get, on the current arrangements, we might get to 1.8. That's still a long way too much. And just to emphasize what it's based on, it's based on the idea that every, every country that's ever said it will do anything, however kind of general, whatever generalized sort of statement, any kind of pledge, that will be completely honored that there will be no creative carbon accounting whatsoever. And, critically, there will be none of that balloon squeezing effect, none of that rebound effect. None of the other countries that haven't made commitments will increase their emissions at all in response to that. So, in other words, an oil company that finds it can't sell as easily to one, company it, to one country because it's got strong carbon targets won't, to any extent, shift its marketing effort and shift to a country that hasn't signed up. Well, for me, that's a completely unrealistic scenario. So I actually think all of this is a, really, is a very optimistic take on it all. So in terms of the practical actions that came out of the COP, woefully, woefully inadequate. But if you want an optimistic take, it will be, it will be about the energy that's, that was in the room and the energy from the business community and the number of people on the, on the streets and the kind of sense that we might be approaching a position in which if we all push harder, we might actually start to, to get there. Okay, next slide, let's have a look at. So here we are, this, yeah, this real race between tipping points. Is the, are the tipping points in the climate system gonna hit us first or can humans, uh, can humans tip first? Um, 
and, uh, and wake up in time. And we, we don't know. And, but we don't know what the odds are. I can't speculate on it. But I do know that the harder we push, the better the odds will be. So, okay, let's have a look at uh, Cumbria. So here's the, here's the uh, carbon target for Cumbria. And it says option three, because we put together a whole load of diff you know, different options with different levels of, of ambition in them. But the one that was selected was the one that we, and it's quite hard to be exact about this, but it's the one that was de we deemed to be the minimum you could get away with would be 1.5 degrees compatible. And we did this target that way around. We didn't say, oh, well, what do we think is realistic first? We first of all looked at what does the science say needs to, needs to, needs to happen. And we included, in terms of what's within the scope of the tar target, all kinds of boundary conditions about what we could and couldn't include. But we tried to include the stuff which we felt Cumbria could have meaningful influence on and which was important in carbon terms and we could in some way measure even if even if just roughly so to have a look at it so the items and so it's in five different components so there's land use land use change in forestry there's visitor travel to and from we've included that because it's so important for Cumbria and because it is something we can do something with then we've looked at the next one down is other good non-edible goods and services that people buy so that's all around circular economy stuff then the green bit is is food that is eaten in Cumbria, and the, I don't know what that colour is, beigey, browny, type, biggest slice there, that's the only uh, direct emissions from energy use, so, uh, so that's, well, that's electricity and gas use and everything and road transport, that's mainly, mainly what that is. And we put them all on trajectories that were science-based, and when you add in, and, and for the land use change, the trajectory there was, you know, based on what was thought to be possible given the land that we've got. And when you add all those together, you get this kind of coincidence that it, t it happens to be 2037 that that comes to net zero. Uh, so we didn't pick net zero because we wanted to, we didn't start by going net zero. We looked at what would be a science-based science way of uh, dealing with all those elements of the carbon. And when, we, and when we did that, 2037 was the number that came out. And it's pretty, um, you know, it is, it is ambitious. It, it, it requires a lot of change, a lot of change. And for some of that change will probably only be possible with some support from government as well. But, you know, that's where it is. And next slide. I'm not going to talk you know, much about the detail of this, but just to, just, this is the final slide I'm going to show, I'm going to skip over the other ones that are left, but just this is a quick view of the average UK person's carbon footprint, and so let's use that to have a look at how Cumbria uh, could cut its carbon. So first of all, about a quarter of it is the food that we eat, and there's tons that can be done there, that's really practical stuff, and we know there are restaurants and shops in Cumbria, I know that some that we're working with and some that we're not working with who really get this, the opportunity to, um, to make fantastic, more sustainable food. The science is very clear that we need to cut by a long way. It doesn't have to be to zero, but by a long way, the amount of meat and dairy in the global diet and the UK diet. Um, and that's got implications as well for how farming is done in Cumbria, and we need to find a way of doing that that really works for the people work on the land, and I know that's a very complex uh, sort of discussion to have, and I know a lot of open-mindedness is required, and, you know, but I am confident that in the, you know, in a more sustainable world, there will be actually more great ways of earning a livelihood on land in Cumbria uh, in a way that is sustainable, and, you know, if getting it right, there will definitely to be no losers, and we probably need more people working the land rather than less. So, on from food, home and accommodation, you know, we've, that's all about, it's mainly about our leaky buildings and how we sort all that out. And that's a lot of that is really expensive and some government help will be pretty handy there. Travel, you know, that's a lot about how, it's not just about electrifying cars, that's the big first thing to say about that. It's also about getting out of cars as much as we possibly can and the 
putting in place the infrastructure for alternatives to that in Cumbria is, gonna, is bound to be a huge, huge part of that. And then the everything else bit contains, is, a lot of that is about the non-edible things that we buy. And that's about you know, buying a bit less stuff and buying high quality stuff that's sustainably made and making it last and looking after it and getting it repaired and getting it in and second-hand markets and stuff. And I think the biggest thing I want to say about this is that if you look at the economic consequences of having uh, high streets where things can, you can get everything you can think of repaired, actually it's a, ri it's a brilliant way of keeping money in the local economy and providing local jobs. If you look at... Um, I've done some simple analysis on this. If you look at the money that, you know, all the money that you spend uh, getting your clothes repaired, your furniture repaired, your IT kit repaired, or whatever, you know, most of it stays right with the person who actually does the job. So it's actually, it's actually brilliant from the kind of local economy perspective. Okay, that's a whistle stop of a few things, and I'll skip over the next few slides, and that's me done. <laughs> Thanks very much, Mike. Um, I'd like to introduce Karen Mitchell, who can now tell us about Cumbria Action for Sustainability. Karen. Thank you. It's great to be here and see so many people interested in what is a real crucial issue. So um, Cumbria Action for Sustainability, or CAFS for short, is a charity, and we work Cumbria-wide, and we fight climate change. Um, our vision is a zero-carbon Cumbria, which is socially, environmentally, and economically beneficial for Cumbrians. Um, so we develop projects and partnerships, we win funds and um, we deliver projects which support individuals, communities, organisations to make that transition from a high carbon to a low carbon lifestyle. We're a small charity, we get very little core funding but um, we work hard to win funding in for Cumbria and over the last 12 months we've brought in over £3 million worth of funding to help our transition. So, um, climate change, we're trying to tackle it. Um, lives need to change, and what I'm going to describe is how we help people make that transition. Um, next slide, please. And click again. Thank you. Um, so, I'm, co I'm fairly confident that everybody in this room, you're here because you're concerned about climate change, but there's an awful lot of people who are not in this room. They're not in the same place as us. Um, so what we work very hard to do is to influence large numbers of people to help them start that journey to, to climate change, to behaviour change, sorry. So we run lots and lots of events. Um, for example, we run webinars that explain the pros and cons of electric vehicles, uh, that explain how to insulate your home, that um, show people um, the technology behind uh, low carbon heating systems. We put out lots and lots of information on our website, in the social media, through the press. We run training programs, um, so we run carbon literacy for organisations where we put the staff um, of those places through training to help them understand the science and also to understand the solutions, to debunk some of those myths about climate change and to give people confidence to then take action. And in the last 12 months we've put around 800 staff from um, several local authorities in Cumbria through that carbon literacy training. We also support numerous uh, community sustainability groups across Cumbria who are helping their neighbourhoods to take action on climate change. So you might call this approach of reaching as many people as we can the broad and light approach. So what happens when we've made this connection? For some people, nothing happens because it's just not for them at that point in time. Others, they might talk to their neighbours and families about it. Um, for others, they will join a group, but they'll, they'll take action. They'll start to change their lives. Next slide, please. So between us, between CAFs and all of these community groups, we've actually managed to reach thousands of people who are actually starting to do stuff differently. They may choose to cycle to work one day a week. Um, they may choose to buy less stuff. They may change their light bulbs. They might take the train instead of flying. So um, we've started to see uh, a change. Next slide, please. So this broad and light approach is a bit like throwing a pebble in the pond and what we see is a ripple effect. We see um, networks and friendship groups and communities starting to pick this up and starting to change behaviour. So we see some carbon is being saved by lots and lots of people. But what we need to do next is to turn those ripples 
into waves. And to do that, we take a targeted approach where we work um, sort of more narrowly but in depth on specific projects or in a specific area. So I'm just going to give you some examples. Next slide, please. One of the things that um, Mike mentioned was um, energy use in buildings. Um, that's a significant contributor to carbon emissions in Cumbria. We do lots of work here. Um, and it's not just about saving carbon. It's also um, because, uh, as Andy mentioned, the high percentage of people in Cumbria who are in fuel poverty. So we run our Coal to Cozy Homes service for people on low income or vulnerable people who are living in those damp, drafty, expensive to heat homes that we we all know and love so much in Cumbria. So we help them to install draft proofing, to change light bulbs, to manage their heating controls better, and we, do, we can do lots more measures in those homes to make them much more comfortable and much cheaper to heat and also saving carbon. We can also provide 30 minutes free phone advice for anyone in Cumbria who is interested in retrofitting their home, making their home more energy efficient. You can commission from CAFs a home energy plan, where we will give you a detailed report on how you can improve the energy efficiency of your home and make it more comfortable to live in. And we can also support you through the process of retrofitting your home. Next slide, please. Another example is the work we do with the Ambleside community with the help of funding from South Lakes District Council, where we've helped create a thriving community organisation called Ambleside Action for a Future, where we're supporting their interest in solar energy generation for the town. Um, we've also developed, brought in some carbon footprinting tools for them to use, both businesses and households, and those tools are available for anybody also to use on our website. Next slide, please. Another new narrow and deep project is um, our Greener Schools project, which we're just launching. We'll be working in detail with 16 schools in West Cumbria, and we'll be able to provide practical support and funding to help both the students and the teachers do an assessment of the environmental footprint of their school and figure out how to reduce carbon emissions through things like waste reduction, low carbon travel, low carbon food, um, energy use in the buildings. And we'll be training the students to do this kind of environmental auditing and it will be the students who lead debates in the school about the solutions um, and it's the students and the teachers who will then be delivering the actions. Next slide please. So we've got some waves forming now. We've done the broad and light. We've raised awareness amongst uh, lots and lots of people. Um, we've done the narrow and deep. We've got several exemplary projects that are saving carbon emissions um, that we can showcase, that we can promote, that can be replicated. We've worked with individuals, householders, communities, organisations. We've got a diverse range of projects, so there's something there that would suit everybody. Next slide, please. But the next approach, the next step, if you like, is the really critical one. It's about making all of that action and activity add up to more than the sum of its parts. We need all of that energy, all that stuff that's happening, to actually impact the gatekeepers of emissions. So these gatekeepers are the people in Cumbria who set the strategies, who develop the plans, who bring expertise, who bring investment and who can affect, on a large scale and in a lasting way, carbon emissions in Cumbria. So we know that when difficult decisions need to be made by councillors or large public sector organisations or big businesses or financial institutions, when they're tossing up you know, their options, what they will look for is public support. And that's what we want to show them. We want to create opportunities for all of this public interest and action on climate change to be shown to the local authorities, to the utilities companies, to the business groups. One powerful way of doing this is through citizens' juries. Next slide, please. So citizens' juries are a, a great initiative um, which are delivered in partnership with local authorities where around 30 randomly selected residents in an area will be invited to join the jury and they are a representative uh, group that reflect the demographics of that area. That group of people, the jurors, will meet several times over several weeks. They will decide what topics to talk about in relation to climate change, um, and experts are then brought in to share their knowledge about those topics. Um, the jurors then um, debate what they've heard and collectively and collaboratively decide what recommendations are 
um, that they want to make to local authorities and to other organisations that might be involved in the process. Um, this kind of work in Cumbria is facilitated by an organisation called Shared Future, um, and they've done several um, citizens' juries. Um, it was led off by Kendall, Kendall Town, who went first. Um, we've just completed a citizens' jury in Copeland called the Copeland People's pa Panel. Um, Barrow is just setting up, um, and hopefully other local authorities in Cumbria will follow. It's a really powerful way to influence the gatekeepers of carbon emissions, the plans and the strategies that local authorities in particular are developing so that they are really significantly informed by um, citizens who've had a chance to really debate and think about this stuff. Next slide, please. So we're making progress now. This wave, this movement on zero carbon is really building. And I think that's really been helped by a Zero Carbon Cumbria partnership, which has already been mentioned. Next slide, please. And, and again, thank you. So um, the Zero Carbon Cumbria Partnership was developed a few years ago when it was largely um, organisations from the public sector, a relatively small group, um, and it's grown and grown. And now we have uh, over 80 organisations involved in it, including district councils, um, parish councils, businesses, conservation groups, national health, utilities, schools and colleges, um, Cumbria LEP, uh, lots and lots of local community groups. This partnership is co-chaired by myself and Angela Jones, who is Executive Director for Economy and Infrastructure at Cumbria County Council. And that's a quite a unique chairing um, to have something like this co-chaired by a public sector person and um, a third sector uh, representative. We report to um, Cumbria's Leaders Board and to Cumbria's Chief Execs Group and we take an evidence-based approach, hence the work that, that Mike has done establishing um, the carbon emissions um, basis for our work. And we adopted, as a partnership, 2037 for zero carbon. And that's, that's targeting the 7 million tonnes of CO2 um, equivalent emissions that, that effectively Cumbria is responsible for, as, as Mike outlined. So that's our transport, our energy, our buildings, the stuff that we consume, the food that we eat. Um, last year, on behalf of this partnership, CAFs won 2.5 million from the National Lottery's new Climate Change Action Fund. So that will enable 11 div delivery partners um, to do more and more of the work that I've just described, more and more of that broad and light and narrow and deep type projects. So you'll see um, more citizens' juries, um, more information about low-carbon food, more options for low-carbon food, more repair cafes where you can get your broken stuff fixed. Um, there'll be youth uh, climate events, a whole programme for young people, lots and lots of training, just heaps and heaps of events. We'll also be monitoring and evaluating our progress towards net zero. There's also resources from that funding to actually support the partnership itself. Um, so we've now got key um, leads from key organisations working together in groups to to chart the pathway, to plan the pathway to net zero for sectors like transport, housing, land use. And it's really through bringing such a diverse range of organisations together that we can break down uh, or understand each other's perspectives and break down some of the barriers. Next slide, please. I just want to give a bit of a plug. I'm getting to the end now. Um, that National Lottery Award also means that we're able to launch, which we will be doing very soon, a new five-year community climate grant fund. So we have 100K in that pot, which will uh, uh, provide funding for community sustainability groups to do more of that engagement of um, neighbours and communities to do, take more action on climate change. So if you're interested in that, do please follow us on our social media. And I will leave you with one final slide. Next, please. Thank you very much. Thanks, Karen. Well done. So I think that's a really powerful message. And Karen, thanks very much for bringing to everybody's attention how this is a grassroots upward process as well as government down or international community down. So I'd now like to hand over to Richard Leaf, who's the CEO, CEO of the National Park in the Lake District, who will tell us how straightforward it all is. Is that right? <laughs> it's 
my microphone works. Can you hear that? Move over here. Move away from that. Um, just a really super quick five minutes from me, just to reflect on the experience in the National Park over the last 10 years and a bit about where we're going. And then a bit about what I think um, our personal responsibility to address this, both as individuals and as leaders. And I'm conscious that we've got a lot of leaders here in the room as well as online. The, the National Park has taken a, a partnership-based approach to looking after the National Park for more than 10 years now, which means it's not us, the park authority, that runs the whole place. We've long stopped kidding ourselves that we could ever do that. But we get together with 25 other organizations to produce a plan for the way we manage the park. Starting in around 2010, we introduced, with the help from Mike here, a carbon budget into the National Park. In fact, we were one of the first territories on the planet to establish its own carbon budget, understanding the total amount of carbon that we as a park were responsible for, all the people that came in and out, all the carbon that was consumed within the park with what we did, we accounted for just in the way that we've now done for Cumbria as part of the Zero Cumbria Partnership. And we set about giving ourselves the challenge as a group of reducing for the whole national park its carbon consumption by 1% a year over that time. Um, it's been 10 years, so you would hope that we'd achieved a 10% reduction in our carbon over that period of time. The good news is that over that time, it has actually gone down, according to our calculations, despite the fact that our visitor numbers have increased substantially over that period of time. The bad news is it's gone down nowhere near as much as we were aiming for. In fact, we've only reduced it by slightly less than 5% over that 10-year period, about half of where we were intending to get to. So now, as part of the wider Cumbria effort, we have recalibrated where we need to be if we want to get to net zero in 2037 as a county. And we did that as a partnership again, and after much discussion, argument, and debate over the course of the summer, we agreed to adopt 2037 as our ambition for the National Park as, the well, as well as the rest of Cumbria. That means that we have to move on a yearly basis, not from the 1% target that we were failing to get to, but we need to move to about 13% a year in our reductions in order to get there. So the, the step change that we need to change is eye-wateringly large. But as Mike has explained and Karen has reinforced, we have no choice but to get, get there. Otherwise, the National Park is worth nothing. Uh, and so for the people who visit it too, it is worthless. So we absolutely must step up our ambition to get there. Do we have a plan? Do we have a roadmap to get to net 37 in the, in the National Park? Well, not entirely, but we do have one for the next five years, because that's the plan that we've just set and we've just agreed. So we've taken the total amount that we need to save uh, by 2037 and apportioned it out and set ourselves a target for 2025 to get to and a roadmap to get there. I've only got two minutes to go into this, but maybe we'll talk about it more. Um, so to cut a long story short, to get to our 2025 milestone, we, at the moment, only have actions in place that we are confident we'll get there for 20% of that journey. So there's still 80% of actions that we need in place to get to our 2025 milestone. That brings me on to our personal commitment uh, as leaders. It is now enormous. We need to become uh, hugely, hugely associated, fluent in the language of carbon for our businesses if we run them uh, or uh, our personal lives if we do that. Take, for example, um, the National Park Authority. We started to become literate in our own carbon as an organization. We're a small organization. We employ about 200 people working in the National Park. And we decided to count our carbon. We've been doing it since, since 2010. 
Since that time, we know we've saved, up until this point, about 60% of our carbon emissions compared to where they were then. We've employed somebody the whole time to do that work with us. In fact, Martin is here in the audience this evening. He counts our carbon. Uh, we pay Martin's huge salary for him to come to work and do that. I'm sure you agree with that, don't you, Martin? Um, but the good news is, Martin saves us a shed load of money because every percent of that reduction he's achieved for us has saved us a lot of money in energy. That 60% is money we no longer spend on that expensive bit of carbon that we can instead spend looking after the national park. And we have a target to get to net zero as an organization by 2025, provided we can find a place to start to plant some trees to net off that final bit of carbon that we can't remove from the business. So my, my final plea is to all of us, particularly those that lead businesses, to become fluent in understanding the carbon that we're responsible for and have a plan for tracking that down. And recognize that in so doing, it'll create you a better world, more engagement with your staff and employees, and ultimately, a place in which we can continue to live and work. Thank you, I'll leave it there. Thanks very much, Richard. Um, some serious challenge there for folks in the audience. Uh, I'd now like to introduce uh, Dr. Simon Carr from the University of Cumbria, who's going to tell us about the journey of a drop of water or something, I think. Simon. <laughs> Gosh, hopefully you can hear me now. Um, yes, you know, I think you know, I just wanted to start off with giving you a, a journey through this landscape. I'm sure you all recognise here Hawes Water from earlier on this summer. This is the reservoir doing its work that it needs to do every year for us. But this is a landscape where, over the last few years, we've recognised that we're getting unprecedented conditions. I only moved up to Cumbria three years ago. Every summer has been really dry. I was told that, no, 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 you're going, to, you're going to develop a pointy head moving here to Cumbria. It's going to be raining all the time. But every summer's been dry, and then it's been followed by short periods of quite intense rainfall. And that's created a perfect storm for this beautiful landscape that we all live and love within. Because that combination of drying out the landscape, drying out the fells, followed by rainstorms, is having a huge impact on our physical landscape today. So I'm going to tell you a short story about a water droplet today and also a water drop in the future. Think of me as a water drop that falling out of the sky as a raindrop. We don't see them very often up here, but we're getting a few of them. Think of all my friends falling onto that landscape. But we're falling onto a dry, quite bare landscape. Land practices over the last decades and centuries have stripped a lot of the natural vegetation of, of Cumbria away. That means that we've got a perfect storm to start eroding that landscape. And we can only think back a few years, we think back to extreme events like Storm Desmond in 2015, where just within the catchment of St John's in the Vale, St John's Beck, 6,500 tonnes of sediment was eroded, transported and moved around within that catchment. That's an area of about 12 kilometres square. Now a large amount of that sediment that was moved around was lost. A good few hundred tonnes. Hannah Joyce at Durham University estimated it to be a good 250 to 300 tonnes of sediment was lost from that catchment in three days. Much of that sediment comes from the uplands, from the shallow peaks that blanket over the, the surface of the, of the fells. Ironically, those peaks are actually one of our best resources within Cumbria. They're probably the UK's best carbon store. If we want to meet our carbon zero um, commitments by 2050 or 2037 within the county, we've got to be not only reducing our emissions of carbon, we've got to be locking a load of it away. And peatlands are seen to be one of the most effective sources of doing that. 20 times more effective at sequestering and storing carbon than forestry and biomass that's produced from that. So our droplet is landing on this landscape which is stripped bare, it's eroding sediment, it's moving through the landscape very effectively. What's that doing to our landscape? Well, because we're eroding our soils and sediments 
Our vegetation's been stripped away. We've lost a lot of the immediate short-term store that that water needs. The water that we depend on for what we call base flow within our river systems, a lot of the water that we drink and use, is normally coming from that soil and vegetation store. By removing that, what happens? My water droplet doesn't infiltrate into the ground surface. It now runs across that ground surface. It starts flowing, overland flow. And I'm sure everybody in this room knows exactly what happens when you get lots of water droplets moving through overland flow. We start getting rivers bursting their banks. We start getting flooding. But we also get other, less visible things that we see. So, for example, we could be overrunning our sewerage treatment and wastewater treatment facilities, injecting large amounts of sewerage un and untreated water back into our water courses. Again, I think there's a representata representation from United Utilities in this room. Last year, United Utilities had over 100,000 individual events where there were combined sewer overflow events, where essentially raw and untreated sewage was released into our landscape. Just think of the environmental health and pollution implications of that. Eventually, my water droplet reaches the sea. I've gone into my river, I'm flowing rapidly down through the system, I get to the sea. Where well, there's the final challenge for Cumbria. We've got the challenge of all that contribution of melting glaciers, permafrost, all of the cryosphere, the thermal expansion of the ocean is creating sea level rise. Much of the Cumbrian coast is fringed by coastal wetlands and lowland areas of salt marsh. These areas historically have been seen as worthless, they've been drained, been used for relatively low value agriculture for grazing purposes. But actually, in recent years, we've recognised, we've begun to recognise the value of those coastal wetlands. They're actually free sea defences. The wonderful thing about those wetlands is that as sea level rises, they accrete sediment. They keep pace with sea level change, which means they act as a free buffer against those rising sea levels that Mike has been talking about from the consequences of what we're seeing. But the problem comes from my drop of water and all my mates all falling down in short periods of time. The changing intensity of rainfall, storm events that we're seeing increasingly affecting the UK means that those salt marshes and coastal wetlands are vulnerable to coastal erosion. We've got the fastest retreating bit of coastline in Britain, just to the south of Cumbria, Wharton Salt Marsh, just uh, down near Carnforth. That's retreated 250 metres in 12 years. Most of that was associated with an individual storm event. We can see the effect of Storm Desmond. We can see the effects last year of Storm Kira and Storm Dennis eating away at that coastal defence. So that's the story of today. Mike has shown what the forecasts are of the future. We're looking at the moment, we're at 1.2 degrees above the pre-industrial temperature. And from the estimates that have come out from the pledges at COP, we're looking at anywhere between 1.8 and 2.4, maybe higher in terms of that temperature change. And some of the things, some of the lessons that have come out of the last year of the IPCC and the COP meeting is that every incremental change will have a distinctive impact on our physical environment. It will change the physical landscape that we see around us. So that means that we've got two futures ahead of us. My water droplet has got two potential futures. The first future is one where we don't meet that challenge. We don't transition to a zero carbon economy. We don't transition to a situation where we're pulling carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. That means that my water droplet gets ever more energetic. Ever more of him and his mates will start falling in very, very short periods of time, creating a cycle of increased erosion, reducing water quality, reducing water security, increasing flooding, increasing coastal damage. That's the trajectory that, unfortunately, we are currently facing. But we've got the opportunity now to have another trajectory. Cumbria is an amazingly fortunate environment. We have 88,000 hectares of peatland. The restoration of that peatland goes a long way in reducing our carbon emissions. But it also has some other benefits. It reduces those water droplets falling through the landscape. It intercepts and stores that water. It gives us greater water security. It gives us, you know, I, I'm amazed that this year we were talking about potential water scarcity in Cumbria. Those wetlands, those buffers, those vegetation stores will start protecting us from those sorts of things. And really it's in the gift of the, everybody that's in this room, everybody that's watching this event, to think about which one of those pathways do we really want to follow.
Thank you. So we've gone from the planet to a drop of water. So I'm going to invite the panellists to come and join us up here. And uh, we'll take some questions. We've got um, 20 minutes. And if people want to leave at half past, they're welcome to. We might overrun for a few moments, <laughs> depending on how many questions we have. So the suggestion I've got here is that we address the global issues for 10 minutes, and then we turn to Cumbria and the Lake District for 10 minutes or so. So they want it for another show next door, I think. Yes. Um, so, just a couple of questions from the people that have submitted questions in advance. Um, we've heard a lot about COP26. I think I'm addressing this to you, Mike. How confident are you we can get... This is a question everybody has asked. How confident are you that we can achieve what needs to be achieved by 2050? Well, not at all confident. But does that mean it's definitely not possible? No, it doesn't mean that. Like, you know, if we, if we carry on as we are, it's clear cut we won't. If we wake up a lot and we start seeing the kind of level of change that Richard was talking about, for example, then, you know, like, like I said, I don't think we can speculate on the odds, but they're not zero, they're not 100%. Um, and the harder we push, the better those odds are. It won't work unless everybody's engaged. No. I mean, I think if I, one thing I wish I'd said a bit more, just to say, you know, if we're not feeling some adrenaline about this, then, then something's not going on right in our brains. You know, we, we, should be feeling, we should be feeling nervous about this. Yeah, especially for grandchildren and yeah. kids, yeah. Um, anybody else want to comment on the global achievability or Cumbria's target of 2037? Cumbria's target of 2037 is ambitious, um, but they are emissions over which we have control. So I think it's, it's in our gift, really, to decide um, how, how much we're going to tackle that and get on with it, basically. And I think, I think we have to be hopeful, because we don't really have a choice, actually. Yes. But it's a particular kind of hope. It's not that kind of wishful hope that somebody's going to sweep in and fix it all for us, because clearly that isn't going to happen. It didn't happen at COP26. Um, so I'm, I'm a, an advocate of, of constructive hope where we actually work for it. So we just have to roll up our sleeves and get stuck in. Haven't got any choice. Mm. A couple of people have asked about carbon offsetting. Shell, for example, tell me they're offsetting any diesel or petrol I buy. British Airways does the same thing if I'm allowed to fly again. What um, do we think nice, of it? did a nice Mike, program on yeah. Shell recently. Uh, yeah. Uh, it's... it's a, Sadly, it's a bogus concept, the idea of offsetting. The idea, yeah, it is a good thing to remove carbon through environmentally, uh, environmentally responsible methods. That's a very good thing. The world needs to do it, and we do need to do all of the measures that the world is capable of doing anyway. The idea that you could have an unnecessary emission and somehow make up for it by removing some of that carbon that we already need to move, it, it just doesn't stack up. There's a, all the nature-based solutions are fundamentally finite, and all the non-nature-based solutions are ones that, whilst we need to develop them as best we can, we should have limited expectation about what is doable with them. So the idea that you can trade your emissions against somehow, it's OK because we've offset them, doesn't work. It's two separate strands of action. So anybody that's offering to plant trees for you? We should plant the trees. We should absolutely yeah. plant the right tree in the right place. So when I talked about the Car Cumbria's carbon target, it was talking about doing what the science said needed to be done in all those five blocks of the carbon budget. And one of those blocks, the negative bit, is about doing the right thing with all the land in Cumbria. Yeah. yeah. And in fact... Yeah. Good. There are lots of applause. It makes us feel like we might achieve something here. Um, and the other day... I was at an event with the northwest of England altogether, and our peatlands are the same area, three quarters of Greater Manchester, which is quite a staggering statistic. Yeah. Um, governments have to act, don't they, if we're going to achieve any progress towards net zero. What, what, is, what is the key thing that governments have to do? 
So I'm one of the things. Easy they, questions. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Should I, is this me again? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Go on. Sure. Have a go, Mike. Okay. We're so on the global I mean, section. specifically, our government. Well, I talked about how the, uh, you can't separate climate uh, from justice, right? And actually, you can't do that within Cumbria. Right. You know, and you can't do it at the, glo at the global level. So the first thing the government should do is get the aid budget back on track. Um, we need a carbon price for, for sure. And just by the way, that carbon price is the means by which we uh, have a fund which can, if we're smart with what we do with it, we can make sure that nobody, uh, nobody's life needs to go downhill as a result of our low carbon transition. And we can fund... Uh, through it, the technologies that we really need to push hard. We can take away the fossil fuel subsidies. That's another way of creating uh, a source of money for the technologies that we absolutely really, really do need. And just by the way, and I don't think the government's going the right way on this, but we need to do a really, really good job of making sure that uh, the right things in terms of land use are incentivized and the people who work the land are actually uh, enabled to do the right thing with every piece of land, you know, in Cumbria and Belong. Yeah, beyond. kind of. Stop yeah? <laughs> I would do that too and put the money I think the elsewhere. government's going to yeah. stop half of it on Thursday. Yeah. Yeah, can I just, can I just ask yeah sure. Steve, I, I think there's something that the government um, could stop doing as well, which is that they have the stop-start stuff, so like the Green Home Grant Scheme, yeah. um, which just didn't, didn't work, um, and, yeah, just that consistency with uh, setting a target right. for... 2050. Oh, and the coal mine, of course. Stop the coal mine. Yeah, stop the coal mine. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's a Cumbria question. Now, questions from the audience on the global situation. Um, there's a gentleman I can see here. I'm going to stand up so I can actually see through the lights. Please, yes. Do you want to wait for the microphone? If you could just introduce yourself in one sure, way. Sure, uh, my name's James Meridoc. Uh, when we're talking politically, it would seem to me that Governments have, we have, we have two choices in that we go down the directed route or we go down the persuading route. If we're going to go, and, and we're fast approaching the time where we have to go down the directed route, and Western economies and, and this sort of country is not very well placed to go down the directed route, it would seem to me that we might have to change the way countries run, operate to effectively get to where we want to go, because we can show graphs that show a decrease in the economy and we're going to get to net zero, but unless we actually direct it to happen through punishment, I guess, as opposed to trying to persuade it to happen through, through bribes or, what, or whatever else you, you, you want to call it, um, in other words, this is good for you, please do it, as opposed to, if you don't do it, this will be very bad for you, effectively, approach. So I think, I think it's just a difference in the way the, what the world is currently running. There's some parts of the world which run like this already, by the way, and they may be the parts of the world that lead the way. Right. Okay, so we'll abandon democracy. Who wants to answer this and make a comment? Mike? <laughs> uh, yeah, you, go, you go first, I'll, yeah. I'll jump in and put my head on the blocks of this one, because I think... I think it's a really valid question. You know, I always remember my, my first ever uh, university boss basically said, you don't expect this place to be a, a democracy, you just expect a benign dictatorship because that will get things done. But I think we're also, by looking at that, that sort of approach, saying we should force people to do that, I think in a way it's actually us absolving ourselves of our own personal responsibilities. 40% you know, of the emissions of greenhouse gases that come from the UK are coming from our own individual actions. And you know, I would say, yes, I think you're right, we need to have much more persuasive government. But actually, we need to be persuading our government to be doing those actions. How many people in this room have written to their own peers, their local councillors, in recent weeks about the, the outcomes of COP? Pressuring them, because it does make a difference. Yeah. And price is a great thing here, and that links back to carbon taxation. Yeah. And the opposite, if you're benefiting the world from a carbon perspective. Yeah, I completely agree with what Mike has said about, you know, I think the fundamental thing that governments at a global level should do is agree the price of carbon that's yeah. actually a true price. £75, pounds, £100 pounds a tonne? $250. $250, okay. <coughs> Get rid of your gas boilers. Right, another question, please. Um, is there anybody over here? Yeah, great. Stephen Wright from the Sacred Space Foundation in Cumbria and honorary fellow of the university. Um, given that there's, it seems self-evidently good that we should want to reduce our carbon emissions, but given there's a body of evidence now that we're not at five minutes to midnight but five minutes past, 
should we not also be di diverting as much resources and attention? And I'm thinking particularly of the research of people like Jim Bendel at Cumbria University on deep adaptation, that we should be preparing people now for ca catastrophic changes in climate and preparing to live with that. Mike, you volunteered. Yeah, okay, so uh, I, think, I think Jim Bendel is wrong that, uh, that collapse is inevitable, right? So it's true that it's possible that we've already triggered some feedback mechanisms that are going to make life, that are going to trigger climatic change that's going to make life pretty uncomfortable and put pressure on global society and so on. That is true that that's possible. But it looks much more likely that if we take very strong action now, we can actually get through this. And that is the, by far the best place to be putting the effort. Yeah. Richard, you wanted to come in. Yeah, just on that adaptation point, I think adaptation is super important for us to do right here in Cumbria. And boy, do we ever have experience of what an unadapted county is like to a changing climate, even the one we've already seen. Um, so we have to redouble our efforts to make sure that all of our infrastructure, the way we manage our land, is better able to cope with the, with the change that we're seeing now. Just one small example of that. We spent, following Storm Desmond, um, three million pounds repairing the damage to the rights of way in the, national, in the National Park, and then another eight million pounds just on one route, the Keswick to Threlkeld multi-user trail. The good news is, in the last storm sequence that we saw just the week before last, the, the paths, the bridges, where we put resilience into them have survived much, much better than the, the, the older stuff we've got. But it just kind of points out the size of the bill that we've got to shift all of our infrastructure in, in, in Cumbria into a climate resilient space. So talking about the carbon reduction agenda is super important. We absolutely must do it. But here in Cumbria, we also have an enormous job to adapt to live with the climate change we're already seeing now. And the Environment Agency's programme is a massive investment too to reduce flooding. <laughs> right, we'll have one last question, I think, on the global situation. There's a lady at the front here. Kate, hi. So basically, people are able to pay to pollute, which is the situation at the moment. So the 1% causes far more pollution than the bottom 50%. So I, I'm basically concerned that if we put a tax on carbon, it's just going to make poor people poorer and the rich will to continue their massively unsustainable lifestyles. Would a personal carbon allowance for each person on the planet be more of a, a solution? Yeah, okay, so the answer is it's really important to get that right, and there's absolutely no reason why it needs to be a, uh, a net cost for poorer people. In fact, completely the opposite, right? So most of the, most of the revenue raised by that tax would be, would, would be raised by taxing people who have high carbon footprints, mainly richer people, and what's critical is what you do with the money. And if you do the right thing with the money, the poorer people in this country would be better off, and particularly better off if they made the right decisions about how they spent their money in a lower carbon way. So you can create an environment in which, by and large, everyone's, everyone's better off, but particularly the ones who, make, who use the incentive scheme that it provides to make the right choices and go down the, the, uh, the low carbon route. But you know, you're absolutely right. It's not just about applying the tax, it's also about how you then, what you then do with the money to make sure everyone's okay. I think just to, to add to that, um, I, I was quite careful in the phrasing saying it's the cost of carbon, not the tax, because at the moment I think we've actually got massive climate injustice within carbon because it's not cost of it enough. But that means that the wealthy and the large companies are able to claim an offset, claim a cost that is actually far lower 
than the genuine cost of the carbon that they're using. So in many ways, coming up with a true cost of carbon that is applied more universally is a way of levelling up that agenda rather than increasing the inequality that we can really see. Great. Thanks, Simon. Um, let's move into Cumbria now. Um, one of the amazing statistics that I hadn't really fully appreciated is half of our carbon is due to visitors to Cumbria. Richard's mentioned 20 million for the National Park or thereabouts. It's a similar number elsewhere in the county, so 40 million. This is a big challenge because how do we get our hands around that carbon and reduce it? Richard, is this one for you? Uh, happy to have a, a, a pitch at that, Steve. Yes, I, mean, I seem to have spent most of my last 24 hours talking about um, transport, and it's pretty critical for us here in Cumbria, given the, the size and the importance of the visitor economy. Um, I, I think, in part, we have a, an opportunity for the visitors in Cumbria, for them to experience a different way of life while they're on holiday. And there is evidence that people are susceptible to change when they're in that kind of environment. So encouraging people out of their car, and ideally, if visitors come, we'd like them to arrive in Cumbria by public transport, and we have a fantastic rail link um, to get to us. Uh, but if they do want to come in the car, then it's really uh, important that people leave that car in one place when they arrive, particularly in the National Park, and don't spend endless amounts of time times driving around. So providing incentives and other means of transport while they're in the National Park, be that a bus, a boat, a bike, an electric bike, um, ideally on a route that is away from the road traffic so that people feel safe in doing it, I think starts to create a much better experience whilst people are on holiday. And also, they get to play around with a different form, a more active form of transport that they may adopt when they are at home in their daily lives as well. So uh, it, it's a, there's no one silver bullet that cracks all of this transport stuff, but I think we need to do a range of things to rapidly take the carbon out of transport as much as we can, and by so doing, help people shift their lives when they're back home. Right, and the, the visitor carbon is dominated by transport, getting here and travelling around, isn't that it? That and food, and the food, can, yeah. the food that visitors consume is also enormous, particularly if it involves transporting liquids into the park. So one of my favourite stats is I think 4% of our visitor footprint is the beer that they consume. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, um, There's no breweries in the audience. We've been encouraging local breweries in the National Park for some time. We've got about 22 of them. If you run <laughs> a, 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 a hotel or a hostelry, please just serve the local the local beer, and by doing so, you have a whacking impact on our footprint. Right. Now, a question of Mike. Do you want to come in? Yeah, I, I just wanted to, uh, there's one thing I just want, want to make sure everyone understands, is that it's basically a good thing for people in the UK to come to Cumbria um, for their holidays. And, you know, and, and then I really like the point that Richard made about how actually when they come here, and you relax when you're on a holiday, it's, you're at your most open-minded. It's a fantastic opportunity to go and influence people. And all those carbon targets that we talked about, they are actually normalised by the numbers, which means that if more people come and spend more time in Cumbria and have those wonderful experiences, actually it doesn't stop Cumbria reaching the target because of the way that, exact way the metric is set yeah. up. And the, the amount of people we've had last year, so that an, awful, an awful lot of people have rediscovered what's on their doorstep as a result of the lockdowns and, and the, the, the fact that they can't travel. Uh, and I hope a bit of that sticks and, and we remain busy uh, because that may mean they're not taking a holiday aboard and, and flying yeah, exactly. to go there. They've discovered, they've discovered the joys that are on their own back garden in their own, back garden in their own national parks. Yeah, sounds like human offsetting that to me. <laughs> <laughs> and by the way, there's a consultation out now on Cumbria's cycling and walking routes, uh, which the county council is running, and that's really a key element of uh, net zero. Um, we haven't talked much about businesses in Cumbria, and there's plenty of them in the audience and online. And they account for quite a significant part of the carbon footprint of Cumbria for both process heat uh, and heating of buildings and offices and the like. Um, 
the local enterprise partnership is coming out soon with a, a way of helping those businesses, but I think the general theory is that the businesses will see the economic benefit of taking action. Uh, would you like to comment on that, Mike, perhaps? I'll start. There's probably other people want to talk about it as well. But yeah, yeah, sure. I think the first thing to say is that there are some businesses that are starting to really get this agenda and getting it and get that doing it properly uh, can be a business opportunity for them as well. And just by the way, we're sitting uh, in the building of one of the one of those businesses that, that absolutely is is getting that stuff at the moment. Um, but I think what I'd really like the sort of business community as a whole to get is that if Cumbria can start to be seen as a place where that transition towards a more sustainable way of living is that we so badly need, and everybody can see we so badly need, is actually taking place, it actually makes this a more exciting place to live, to visit, for everything. And, you know, and that's about, like, can we together build momentum on this whole thing? It's, you know, if we get it right, it's a really exciting agenda for Cumbria. Right, let's have some questions from the audience. Um... Can the microphones see anybody that wants to ask a question on Cumbria or the lakes? Oh, there's a question over here. And sorry, was that a gentleman in the front or? Yeah, Giles. Yeah, let's find a microphone. Oh, do you want to go to this lady first? Sorry, <laughs> blinded by lights. Um, I think one of the. Um, my name is Sarge Gaffar. I'm CEO of Multicultural Cumbria, and we're just going through a process of because of COP26, looking at our digital out, output and carbon footprint. But what we found really confusing for the layman is a measurement that we find comparable to actually understand what we can actually do as individuals as well as businesses. So for me, I didn't know how much sending a thank you uh, email would cost. So I think it was something like 81,000 trips to Madrid if everybody stopped one email throughout the year, one Brit. Um, and that really shocked me because I can compare that. And while we definitely as an organisation are looking at our carbon footprint, it's not really that easy to find out what we can do on a day-to-day -day basis um, to do that. So who do we reach and how do we reach um, yeah. that support? I have been talking to Michael Sidall. Um, I only found out he was in our building. And um, uh, again, about supporting businesses, small businesses to look at that. But um, I didn't know that was available, and I think a lot of other businesses don't. So, but for individuals, how can we have a comparison that is easy to yep. uh, put into place, if you understand what I mean? That's very clear. Thanks. Karen, I'm sure this is for you. I'm wondering whether Mike covers that in your How Bad Are Bananas, <laughs> where, where there's a lot of statistics. You need to start by buying How Bad Is <laughs> A Banana. my book, but it is all in How Bad Are Bananas. <laughs> and you can chill out about emails, which is the good news. It's um, all in the book, but businesses. Yeah, so businesses, I mean, it's great that you're looking at your business. Um, I mentioned we've got a carbon footprint calculator on our website, so if that would, that would help you perhaps formulate your thinking and, and kind of help organise... <laughs> what you're looking at, and there will be suggestions in there as to what you can actually then do um, to reduce your carbon emissions. But I think it's sort of symptomatic of Cumbria, really, in that big businesses have got the resources to appoint you know, a specialist who can look at all of this stuff, but the majority of businesses in Cumbria are really small, um, and finding the right technical advice is, we know that is a barrier, and we provide as much advice as we can, but as a charity, that's, that's a bit limited at the moment. Um, but yeah, the University of Cumbria have got an Eco Innovations um, series of events coming up for businesses which will be looking at um, zero carbon and how to reduce your carbon emissions. So that, that would be a great place to go as well. Thanks, Karen. Yeah, I'm sure there's plenty of help available. And uh, Karen's the best bet to start with, I'm sure. <laughs> now, there were some questions over here from Giles. Um, this gentleman down here. Sorry, he's a long walk for you. It's all right. Cumbria University students, they move fast. Thank you very much.
very much. I'm, I'm Giles Archibald. I'm a, a councillor at SLDC and I'm also a student of London University where I'm studying climate change. And as part of that, I got to be an observer at COP, uh, which was fascinating and very distressing and disappointing. Um, but my, my, my question, and, and, and by the way, as a councillor and previously as leader of SLDC, I want to just express my gratitude to you for all that you have done and are doing and for the frankness with which you've addressed us this evening, because I think often people pull back from telling the absolute truth, and I think you have, and I'm delighted, grateful for that, and we do need to move faster. But my question relates to pension funds, because as I saw Karen's slide of all of the uh, uh, participants in Zero Cumbria, uh, I couldn't help uh, but think about the pension funds that they are contributing to, and those pension funds, by and large, have not aligned themselves with a 2037 uh, end date for, uh, for carbon use. So I just, and, but, but this is not, this is a nuanced question because it's not a black and white issue. I'd just be interested in your views on whether uh, investment in fossil fuel companies, in pension funds, would be something that we should stop or that we should continue it because we can try and influence them in their actions. So what is your view on pension fund investments? Uh, beyond 2037. Um, thank you very much. I think it is really Im an important area, and I know that for the individual it can be tricky to have the control over your pension fund that you'd like to have, especially if it's a company pension or something. You know, in the small world, in our business, we, we had, you know, we didn't want any, uh, we, we wanted a climate responsible pension fund, including with no fossil fuel in it. I had to put somebody really smart on this for two weeks of digging around in order to find a choice of two funds that we felt we were happy with. Uh, one was Aviva, but the, for anyone who's interested, one was a, an Aviva fund and one was a Royal London Exchange fund. Or just to share that since it took us so much work to what, get What sort of commission are you on, Mike? <laughs> I'm not on a commission. No commission, no, nothing to declare. Um, but uh, so it's, it's really important in, in terms of you know, how the world of the investment world, and we're working with this a bit, is waking up to, you know, uh, trying to uh, raise its game on what they call ESG, environmental social governance um, metrics. But it's way, way inadequate. The whole world of ESG is, is in investment is not up to the mark. And we're trying to do some stuff with one investor to try and to try and help raise the game on that. The question of whether to stay engaged or whether to get out it's only, worth st it's only okay to stay engaged if there is a condition under which you will get out, which means in the case of the fossil fuel companies, I can't think of one, possibly not even, well, may, there may be one or two who would meet those criteria. I mean, they're, by and large, they are not doing what they need to be doing and, you know, to the extent that they need to be divested from. And that, you know, that strategy is beginning to work. Can I just Thanks, um, mention that I'm the proud owner of shares in oil and gas companies, which I have bought one share each in three different um, oil companies uh, through an organisation called Follow This. And basically what they do is put forward, you know, because as, as a shareholder, sorry, I, I can vote at the AGM, um, and Follow This uh, basically promotes the buying up of one share each, which gives a vote, and then motions can be put forward requiring action on zero carbon. It's a form of disruptive shareholding. And you can also give these shares as gifts at Christmas, so <laughs> you might want to think about that. Thanks very much. I'm just curious as to how we can achieve a 2037 zero carbon date, whilst the pension funds have a longer date for the zero carbon. I'm not, again, I don't want to be polemic about it, I'm just trying to understand what your thinking is relative to that disconnect between the pension fund's target dates and our 2037 target date. Look, the good news for Cumbria is it's got a good opportunity for some negative emissions, so it doesn't need to get to absolute zero. Also, are the pension funds within the scope of the target? I don't want to get sort of into too detailed a discussion about it, but I actually think, although that, it doesn't mean we shouldn't take pension funds really seriously, because we should, I don't think they actually lie within the scope of the target. Or we could discuss why not. Right, so we're going to get too deep <laughs> in the weeds there. Let's have another question, please, on Cumbria or the Lake District. Um, I'll let the microphone pick the speaker. Hello. Look. 
Yeah. Hi. Yes, um, my name is Cecilia. I'm in um, an organisation called Sustainable um, Integrated Transport for Oldswater. And um, there's a question for Richard. You talked about um, encouraging people not to use their cars, but um, have you any plans for a regular, very regular bus service? So it was very noticeable this summer that the increase in the service from Penrith down to uh, all the way to Windermere made a big difference. So uh, in spite of COVID, lots of people were using the bus. But once an hour isn't enough. We need four times an hour small buses and that are prepared to make diversions. So for instance, to go to the quiet site, not just drop people at the bottom of a hill. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Um, buses aren't in my responsibility. They're in the responsibility of the county council. But we have been working with partners over the course of this summer through our Safer Lakes programme to just trial some things differently with, with money that we received in the, in the county to support our COVID response, recognising that we were, we were receiving an awful lot more visitors during the summer period than we ordinarily might. And as a result of that, we got the opportunity to experiment with a few things. So, we had a, a park and ride in Wasdale, the very narrow road between Wasdale Head and the bottom of the valley that proved popular. Um, that was a subsidised service. It cost £2 to park your car and you got the free shuttle up. The road wasn't shut, um, but enough people went in to do that to, to avoid the traffic chaos that we'd experienced there. Um, we also had a free shuttle from Cockermouth into Buttem Buttermere. Who knew? And, and that, that worked really well. A park and sail service in Keswick that John in the room here supported, that was great too. And Stagecoach partnered with us to reduce fares, some concessionary fares, I think children went free in the Oldswater Valley. So there were these various things we trialled and I would love to see uh, an acceleration and expansion of those kind of trials so that we can work out what works. Unfortunately, the, the financial realities of things at the moment means we have to try to find things that work commercially that Stagecoach can take forward because there is no longer any public sector uh, financial support to transport systems in Cumbria. That's just a fact of the situation. So, so in trialling these things, we can hopefully find some that can work on a commercial basis and can be extended out of the summer seasons in the way you described. If I had a magic wand, I'd bring back the subsidies tomorrow and we'd have lots more buses and they'd all be electric. Right. Very good. Can we have the microphone down to Adam here, please? Hi, good evening. Adam Day from the Farmer Network. I was brought up in a hill farming community on the most northerly edge of the Lake District. Um, I was interested, Mike, that you focused on your big pinwheel on the top right-hand quarter, which was food. Um, understanding the baseline document, uh, uh, as I do, I see that the baseline document says that um, in order to achieve the pathway that you've set in the farming community, we'd be looking at a 67% reduction in dairy and meat consumption by 2037. And that's very challenging for the farming community at a time when actually demand for red meat is rising and dairy, 99.6% of households in this land eat meat and dairy products to a greater or lesser degree. Understanding that 67% reduction, I ask the question, what do we replace that with? And what sort of foodstuffs will it be? Because I would imagine that there will be foodstuffs that we will find very challenging or impossible to grow in this county. And therefore, that suggests that we'll be importing more food. And if we're looking globally to do that, when we see the challenges across the globe, like India, uh, well, across the globe, 40% of food produced across the globe is by irrigated water. The severe challenges of places like India, where the, the water table is falling massively. And my question to you is, why within all of this, as the farming community focuses on carbon net zero and wants to uh, be part of that challenge, why are we not talking about sustainable food production as well in Cumbria? Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Adam. Mike? Yeah, I'll take it it's, really, really, you know, it's a really good question, and this is a complex area, and we need to get it right, and we need to get it right 
by taking account of the interests of all the different many stakeholders in it. That's the first thing I want to say. I think the evidence on the need for cutting meat and dairy consumption at the global level and even more than that at the UK level is, is really clear cut. And whether you look at it from a climate perspective, a bio, biodiversity perspective or a feed the world perspective, all those things come together. That, what I'd like to see happen in Cumbria is a really good analysis of, given all of that, what is the best thing to do with each piece of land. And there is some land in Cumbria where I think the best, you know, the, the outcome of that analysis will be the best thing to do is to put sheep or cows on it in the most sustainable way, right? And probably, I haven't done that detailed analysis on every patch of land in Cumbria yet, but probably the result of that will be that Cumbria will produce more meat and dairy than Cumbria's population, including its visitors, will need to be eating when they're eating, you know, the amount that fits with, with a sustainable dietary trajectory, right? In which case, I'd like to see Cumbria and Cumbria farmers exporting that meat, whether it's to the UK or beyond the UK, as an absolutely premium product to be eaten as a treat for a very good sum of money because people will understand that this is the most sustainable way of doing what's actually quite a high carbon product. Um, but it's the most sustainable way of doing it and there's room for a bit of it in everybody's diet. So that's what I'd like to see happening. What do you replace it with? Well, you know, I went out for a meal at Zeffirelli's in Ambleside the other day after a film, and, you know, they don't, I don't think they even say that they're a vegetarian restaurant. They just are, and the food's great. And they're not, there are other examples of that in the Lake District as well, which doesn't, I'm not, you know, I'm not a vegetarian or a vegan. None of us need to be. It's all about the proportions. And, you know, I know, it's a, I know it's a tricky message for a lot of farmers because the truth of it is that the circumstances have changed and that has to imply some change for farming practices. And I know that support is needed in certain places. But, you know, I am confident that there is a pathway through this that can work for everybody. Okay, thanks. A great question. I think that covers off quite a range of the sectors of the economy in Cumbria. and It's very complicated. Yeah. Uh, but the key to it is going to be communication and discussion and agreement on Yeah, the, and the, really the, intelligent yeah. sort of analysis of it all. Yeah. Right. And if I could come in, I think, Adam, we also need to go to work on precisely working out what your agriculture 2040 net zero target looks like in Cumbria. What does that mean for an individual farmer if they're going to get there? Where are they going to make those savings? Which bits of their current business model are they going to remove the carbon from in order to get to that? Uh, I think it's an enormously challenging time right now for our farmers. And, uh, and I remain convinced that there is a sweet spot in Cumbria in which we can retain traditional farming practices that shapes our landscape, whilst at the same time making sure the national park gets w wilder and we start to see more nature regenerated our farmers are rewarded and paid for that, alongside, at the same time, storing more carbon in our soils by, again, subtle changes to the business model of the way in which we do our traditional agriculture to get us there. And, and there are little glimpses of this future across the Lake District. It's just not evenly distributed. So our, our job working together is to spread that best practice to as many of your members as we possibly can so that we can all move together and recognise there is a future, but it's challenging and requires change, and that change needs financial support. Very good. Now, I think we're probably going to have to come to a close because um, this could go on for hours. Uh, it's just such an enormous subject. Maybe what we should do is have a repeat sometime later. and We won't bother with any presentations. We'll go straight into questions. So with everybody's consent, um, which is important in carbon reduction, um, I think we'll bring things to a close. So I want to thank everybody for coming. Um, it's good of you to turn out on a dark evening. And I'd like to thank everybody for joining the live stream. Um, I hope that in some small way we've helped to increase the impetus and the positive attitude to achieving net zero in Cumbria, which is in our interest and indeed in everybody else's. 
Um, I've got a series of thanks. Um, first of all, I want to thank our excellent panel, Simon, Mike, Karen and Richard, uh, who've put themselves in the firing line, but we need to put them more in the firing line next time round, don't we? So I'm sure we can do that. And thanks for your presentations. Um, particularly like to thank the Westmoreland family, who own Regged and much else beside, and are indeed an exemplar of uh, sustainable businesses. Um, they've done a great job. They've given us Regged for nothing for the evening. They've provided drink and food and support from their staff. Um, the always very impressive University of Cumbria has really stepped up. Um, they're providing all of the camera work, as I said earlier, and the live streaming to our audience. And they're now going to put out some material and we'll make sure everybody in the room has access to that uh, by way of um, edited video uh, and clips that can be put out on social media and the like. Um, the support that we get from Armstrong Watson for the Cumbria Club is greatly appreciated. And Caroline Adams is hiding somewhere, but she's worked like crazy on this for weeks now. And Andy's had to phone me up once or twice and say, just back off a bit, will you? Um, but she's done a fantastic job. So I, in summary, then, I hope you've all enjoyed the evening. Um, I'd like you to think about joining the Cumbria Club. It might be your only way of getting into the next meeting, um, like this. <laughs> um, and if you've enjoyed this, um, feel free to go on the website and drop them a tenner or a million, whatever you fancy. Um, I once went on a guided tour in Reykjavik in Iceland. It was the best tour I've ever been on. It was run around the town by a bunch of students. And they said it was free. And at the end, they said, will you now please pay for what it was worth? <laughs> and they probably made a lot more money that way. Um, so thanks again. I wish you all a good evening and a safe and environmentally conscious journey home. <laughs>